Hey guys, I am so honored to be here. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, this place was integral along with my local church and really shaping uh, kind of our philosophy of ministry that sending capacity ought to be valued even over seating capacity. And so uh, we are just, man, I'm grateful to be here with you guys. I'm gonna be in Mark chapter five today as we just continue our study right through the book of Mark. So if you have a copy of scripture, you can turn with me there. Uh, today we're gonna just kind of uh, not get in maybe to all of the mechanics of it, but I want to talk to you the result, uh, talk to you about the results uh, of demonic possession, demonic oppression, demonic influence. I want to talk to you today about the power of Jesus and the fear of demons, okay? Uh, it was in 2014 that we had one of our uh, incredible college students, Christelle, and she was doing a city project with us, and that's kind of our summer, uh, our summer program for our college students that are going into leadership, and she was with us there, and uh, it was her mission trip time, and they, uh, she was on the team that went to Montreal, okay? Now, nobody really understood this. But even uh, as she was going to Montreal, she had a bit of a uh, check in her. She, she, honestly, she wasn't really excited about it. She didn't really want to go there. She had wanted to go to Serbia. Uh, that didn't work out because of some visa issues and things like that. So she wasn't able to do that. They get to Montreal. Man, the soil is hard. It's tough, okay? Uh, they're having doors kind of slammed in their face. They're not seeing a lot of fruit. Halfway through the trip, Christelle is beginning to question, uh, why am I here? What are we doing? God, what are you doing? It's becoming even some bigger bigger questions than that that many of us have probably wrestled with at different times in our life. They're out in the countryside, they hop on a train, they're heading back to, to, to the city and get back to their lodging and all of that. And I'm on, you know, Christelle's got her earbuds in just like many of us would, right? She's just kind of just kind of relaxing a little bit after a long day on the train. And she hears someone call out through and over the music, Christelle. And she kind of, you know, she don't know anybody, you know, they're, they're, and it's not one of our teammates. And so she looks up and there's a woman that's got kind of an odd appearance, an odd gaze, and she's looking right at her and she says her name, Christelle. And she looks at her and she says, do you think your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Now, the interesting thing about this story is that the woman was speaking in French, which is not all that interesting there in Canada, okay? The interesting part about it though, is that Christelle was the only member of our team that could speak French. And so the woman is speaking French to Christelle and Christelle hears her and she says, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And Christelle actually for a moment thought, man, I'm not sure if this is a believer. I'm not sure if this is an opportunity for me to share the gospel. Before she could answer, the woman stepped in again and she said, do you think that you are going to enter paradise all in French? And before Christelle could even say yes, the woman looked at her and says, well, you are not. She begins then bomb after bomb after bomb calling out the sins that are in Christelle's life, secret sins that Christelle said, yeah, that's right. Man, you're questioning God this way. You're questioning God this way. She begins to look uh, and, and, and talk about things that are going on in Christelle's extended family, actually in different parts of the world. She begins to look at other people that were part of our team and talk to them about how Christelle thinks she's going to heaven, but actually she's going to hell. She stands up. She begins to walk towards Christelle in a very odd swaying motion. And as she gets up, the, the guys on our team get up and they, they kind of get in front of Christelle and she looks at Christelle and she says, why are you so afraid? all in French, and then her head spun around backwards. No, I'm just kidding, that, that part didn't happen, okay? That part didn't happen. The rest of it happened. Man, I bet you got chills, I had chills. Every time I've ever heard Christelle talk about that story and our college students, I get a little bit of chills from that. Here's what I wanna chase down today in my short time, all right? Why are we so shocked by a story like that? And why do we naturally assume that there's probably many times some type of physical explanation for that? Even in the church, I feel like even in my own life, okay, and I've experienced these things. If you plan a church, you will experience physical manifestations. There will be things that happen. Uh, I, I mean, I've experienced it as well. And yet even I can be seduced by the cultural lie. Listen, this is where we live. This is the air that we breathe. You guys know this to be true, that every problem has a pill that fixes it that every single psychological issue has a practice that will fix it. Man, it's the air we breathe. Our society is becoming increasingly secular in these things, and even the church can be a little bit, I think, even I can be, y'all, sort of lulled into sleep. Why? Because there is such self-reliance. It is very soothing in believing that every problem that we will face in this world has some type of physical, you know, physical root to it and can be fixed by something, either in the scientific field or the medical community. There is a soothing self-reliance to that, that even we can end up 
buying into. And you know what? Mark chapter five, I think, is written for the church to give us faith to remember something and to believe in something. And that is Ephesians six. Y'all, we do not wrestle only against flesh and blood. That Jesus Christ is the powerful one that is powerful even over the demons. I think we can chase this big idea together. Jesus has the power to free people from the grip of demons. Jesus is the Lord over even the demons. When he speaks, they bid and do what he has commanded. And we need to run and we need to cling to that, okay? Uh, I think about this, whether you're, whether you're preparing for ministry, y'all, whether it's somebody online that's seeing this, uh, whether you're one that is, 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 uh, is, is thinking about maybe even a secular vocation, but this is your undergrad or whatever it is, okay? All of us as believers, uh, we have a ministry and that ministry is not only praying to God about physical things, but there is a demonic and evil realm that lurks and we need to be ready to respond rightly, but we won't be if we're asleep. I think Mark chapter five uh, is this. It's cold water in our face, okay? That's what it is. I think, I think, I think uh, you know what it is? It's when you went to youth camp when you were younger and somebody came running in at five o'clock in the morning banging a pot <laughs> and a spoon, you know, really loud. That's what Mark chapter five is. It's for us to remember that we don't wrestle only with flesh and blood. Let's look at Mark chapter five today. Y'all, I wanna chase some of this stuff down. There's a lot we could talk about, but I just wanna try to get into this idea of Jesus and his power and maybe talk about some ways that we can demonstrate trust in that and we'll be done uh, with our time together. Here we go, Mark chapter five, starting in verse one. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Uh, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met, out, <clears throat> there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bring, uh, no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him night and day among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. You guys heard uh, from Pastor Ryan last, uh, just a couple days ago about Jesus calming the storm. Well, he comes out of Mark 4 and he calms one storm and now he walks right into a situation where he encounters a man who has a storm that is raging inside of his heart because demons have taken up residence in this man. Now, I said this a minute ago, I'm gonna say it again, all right? Uh, I'm not primarily trying to pray, tra chase academically the mechanics of possession, oppression, influence, and all of that kind of stuff today. A sermon like this can die the death of a thousand qualifications. Uh, listen, we just wanna chase the power of Jesus over the power uh, of demons. I don't know about the mechanics. What I wanna talk to you about is the result. The result of demonic oppression, possession, influence, and this story is uh, very simple. It is a broken man. The result is physical torment and pain. The result is social isolation. The result is emotionally being tormented. That's kind of the demonic trifecta, if you think about it. Socially isolated, emotionally tormented, and physically in pain. He is living in a tomb. He is crying out. He cannot be bound. All right, I don't know about you guys. This story scared me to death as a kid, all right? I mean, this slap scared me to death. Uh, and there's, why? Because there's something about it that rings true in us. And I think for children, it's not that this isn't scary, it's just that we serve someone who has more power. We need to maybe lean into that. But there is something that rings true in humanity in a story like this. Actually, one Catholic priest said, uh, that's probably why the movie The Exorcist is still considered uh, one of, probably the scariest movie that has ever been uh, created 30 or 40 years ago. And people still put it at the very top of fear. Why? This is what the Catholic priest said, because something about it rings true. I'm not talking talking about all the weird stuff and the head spinning and all that. I don't mean that. What I mean is that there is something evil that lurks. There is something that is not flesh and blood and it comes for us. And that's what this passage shows us. It shows us the intent of the demonic realm. And that is to seek and destroy what is made in the image of God. Demons seek and destroy what is made in the image of God. They want physical pain. They want social isolation. They want emotional torment. Man, you see this? I know there are other things. I know that you get into the, the, the pastoral epistles and man, you know, false teaching can end up being demonic and lies that you hear can end up being demonic. And whenever you catch yourself, talking in the third person all the time inside of your own mind. You know, why would you say you if you're talking to yourself? Okay, there's a lot of things that can happen that are demonic in the sort of everyday realm. But this passage is talking a little more about some of the things that Jesus saw and some of the things that I think we see. We just call them by another name because we've been lulled to sleep. We, we see many of the same things that Jesus saw, physical deformity, 
Luke chapter 13, we see blindness, muteness. Uh, we see people that are going through all types of physical, social, emotional torment and, and, and just come crazy stuff that people are dealing with in their life. And yet we call physical what the Bible says in many cases. I'm not saying in every case. Man, just as foolish as saying it is in every case is saying it, that it is in no cases, okay? I'm not saying in every case, but many times there is a spiritual component to these things that demons delight in as humans are being destructed. Mark Ritchie wrote a book called The Spirit of the Rainforest, okay? And it talks about jungle man, a Yanomamo shaman that was coming out of the lifestyle of living to the praise of the demonic realm. And he talked about what it looks like to live in isolation with demonic spirits all around uh, for the course of your entire life where you're bowing down to them, they're praising you. Can you imagine what the demonic spirits would praise him over? Do you think it was good deeds? Do you think it was community ministry, right? What would he be praised over by the demonic realm? It was rape, infanticide, blood feuds, and honor killings. This is the destruction that, de that, that the demonic realm seeks. And that's what we see here. I mean, this man is totally broken. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him and was crying out with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, do not send them out of the country. Verse 11, now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. Verse 13, so he gave them permission and the unclean spirit came out and entered the pigs and the herd numbering 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country and people came to see what had happened. Traditionally, people say that the demons are coming running out because they see the lordship of Jesus and they bow down before Jesus, which may be true. It may also be true that people that I've witnessed and, and I think this is probably true that are dealing with demon, demonic possession, oppression, affliction, influence, uh, many times go in and out of it. And so is it, what's happening here? Has the man come running out because the demons are bowing down before Jesus? Or in a moment of clarity, is the man seeing somebody that might be able to help him? And he's running to Jesus and he bows down, maybe not understanding how, but he's seeing in Jesus somebody who may have power, I'm not sure. Either way, Jesus is asking the demons to come out is what the Bible says, and the demons pivot here. What do they do? Man, they try to boast. They try to make themselves seem bigger than they are. What is up with this name? My name is Legion. A legion with 6,000 Roman soldiers. What is the demon trying to do? He's probably, again, there, man, some of this could be, you know, but he's probably boasting. He's probably trying to make himself look bigger and badder than he really is. But Jesus Christ, of course, calls his bluff. You know, one of the things that's interesting about this in verse 13, Jesus just kind of says the word and they're gone. One of the things that we've got to realize in this passage, y'all, as we learn it, as we teach it, is that the demonic realm really has no chance you know, it's not a fair fight, honestly. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Super Bowl, okay? It's Tom Brady versus Mahomes. I know Mahomes is great, but come on, you know? It's like, and I love Mahomes, all right? My, my little boy, he, my nine-year-old, he was like, man, he was tore up. He loves Mahomes. He was tore up when, the, when Tampa Bay is just delivering a beat down and, and all that. And, uh, and, I, and he's like, what, Mahomes this and Tom Brady that? I'm like, buddy, Mahomes is the best quarterback in the league, but he's going up against the GOAT. And in a moment that is going to be remembered, I mean, you can't, I mean, he's just going up against the greatest of all time. And my son looks at me and he says, yeah, well, Tom Brady's so great. How come he's not in any, in any State Farm commercials? I was like, I was like, man, that's a good point, you know? Uh, I didn't know. Uh, you know, it's, it's, man, we see this David, I mean, come on, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit funny here. Uh, I, maybe Mahomes had a little better chance here than the demons, but you understand what I'm saying. There was no chance. This was not like a fair fight. I want you to see the power of what is going on. I need to understand the power of this. Man, we have been fed for a solid year that the biggest problem any of us will face is physical. And it will be fixed when there's a physical fix. And I need to hear this. We all need to hear this. Oh, somebody online needs to hear this today. Man, that we need to realize our biggest problems aren't necessarily physical all of the time. But there is a God in heaven whose son, Jesus Christ, commands the demons. Look at how big this problem is. I want you to think about this. The demoniac couldn't be bound physically because of how he was bound spiritually. Think about that for a minute. This is a man who could snap chains and snap shackles. Why? Because he was bound by so, something that was so much stronger than chains. 
He was bound by something that was so much stronger than the physical realm. Listen, and yet when Jesus Christ, not a fair fight, the power is here. When Jesus Christ steps up to the plate, he, he, in a word, they are gone. And what happens? What happens here, okay? The people that are watching all this, they end up being afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they see a power in which they know not. A little bit like the fear of the disciples when they see the storm and all that. Man, they're, they're afraid. They see something here. Not only that this man has had these demons cast out, but they're also afraid, verse 11 and 14, I'm not gonna go back and read it. They're also afraid, y'all, because of what these pigs do, all right? Uh, he, he, you know, we, we mentioned a minute ago, we kind of live on a hobby farm, try to produce a, a certain percentage of our own food for our family and stuff. And uh, it's funny because the, one of the things I, I noticed about this story that you wouldn't know if you didn't have them. I understand a little bit about this story because I've got pigs and pigs don't do this. All right, p- pigs will, they will herd, okay, they will, they will stampede, but they're not dumb enough to jump off of a cliff. Now, a sheep is, okay? Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. I mean, 2007, all right, you got one sheep in Turkey falls off a 40-foot cliff and 1,500 others jump willingly <laughs> to the horror of the Turkish farmers, created the world's largest pillow just right there in Turkey, Okay. A sheep will do that. A sheep will do stuff like that. Man, a pig won't do stuff like that. Okay, you try to put a pig on a trailer or try to put a pig somewhere. Man, a pig is looking around. A pig is every bit as smart as a dog, all right? They're not gonna do this. When the people look and they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened is this guy was absolutely out of his mind. Jesus speaks to him. Now all of a sudden, 2,000 pigs are out of their mind. There is a power in this world that is scary, yet how scary is the one who commands it? How much more powerful is he if this guy's okay and they're drowning in the Sea of Galilee, which has great symbolism, by the way. You know, we might talk about that. Revelation 20, the lake of fire, what's gonna happen to all demons? They're gonna be thrown in the lake of fire. I mean, they're they're looking at this and what happens? They're afraid. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began, listen, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Okay, I'm gonna gonna take, I'm gonna go on a limb here just for one second. Here's what I wanna say, okay? Is it wrong to want Jesus to get away from you? Obviously, okay, yeah, that's not not great, to to have Jesus and want him to leave. Is their fear here wrong? And another way to phrase it, Is it right that they were afraid? I think that's actually a very deep question. I think that's an interesting question. I mean, we're, you know, no, don't have the spirit of fear, got it, fear God, okay. You know, what's going on here? They're they're afraid of something. Maybe I don't know quite, quite the answer to that, but here's what I will say is worse for us today. Man, we can be lulled to this just because, man, we're studying or whatever. Man, just because I'm in ministry, I can absolutely be lulled to sleep when it comes to the demonic realm and it shows up in my prayer life. You can as well, okay? But certainly the culture around us, these people saw something so powerful in Jesus that they were afraid. Yet we live in a culture that sees something so anemic in the demonic realm that we don't even think we need Jesus. Now, which is worse? Which is scarier? (laughs) We live in a place where we normalize what is so clearly demonic. Even in our culture, what we say is every problem has a pill, every psychological problem has a practice. I would say it like this, man, if we can think to Isaiah and he lived among a people with unclean lips, what about us? We live among a people of extreme arrogance. We can end up leaning into that ourselves. You know, I think about this because I've been all around the world and many of you guys probably have as well or will, believing every problem has a physical cause and my book is both arrogant and extremely Western, <laughs> okay? If you, if, you have, if you have ever been anywhere else in the world, you know that other people around the world don't think about these things the way that we and our culture increasingly is tending toward. They don't. Even without the gospel understanding, they do understand, man, the whole world is not just made up of dust, but there's a breath component to it some kind of way. They understand this and we should understand it well. Y'all, I've seen this with my own eyes and yet I can be lulled to sleep. Man, I've prayed with people who were one way when you were beginning to pray and they were another way at the end of the prayer. Man, we do a lot of work in different parts of the world. We send teams into South Asia and when they go in, when they physically preach the gospel in the slums of South Asia, there will be many times physical manifestations of the demonic presence that is there. When you ride into the high jungle uh, of Peru, Okay, and you're riding in, 
and you begin to feel something on your chest and a missionary leans over to you and they say, hey, you understand Satan has had his grip on these jungles for a thousand years and he's not giving it up very easily. We can see it there, we can feel it there. And then sometimes, even me, even as I lead a church, then sometimes all of a sudden in our monthly elder prayer meetings where we call out the sheep that need it by name, we get on our face before God and we begin to pray for them, all of a sudden we can be lulled into thinking, man, that addiction that is destroying their life and making them behave in a way that looks a whole lot like this, it's gotta be a physical cause. God, heal them of the physical cause. It's almost like a secular prayer. We begin to think about somebody who's wrapped up in addiction or somebody who's going through a marital issue. We anchor it solely in the physical or maybe in a sin, but we forget to pray and ask God to put hedges. We can be lulled to sleep. I put hedges around them for the demonic realm. We can begin to think that war isn't spiritual, but it's something that's physical. Let's finish the story here. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. That's interesting to me. I wanna talk about that in a minute. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Uh, Tony Marita, Pastor Tony Marita says it like this. Uh, it takes the power of Jesus to turn a madman into a missionary. And that's what happens here. He ends up going from a madman living in the tombs to being sent out for the gospel. There's so much there that we could talk about. Maybe we'll get to it. Uh, here's the, listen, we have a big idea. This, this, this idea of trusting the power of Jesus, he is powerful over the demonic realm. Guys, I wanna call you to one application point. We'll flesh it out a couple of ways, but it's this. Hey, trust the power of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand, you know, you, you guys, man, you've heard a million sermons in your life, so have I, okay? Sermons are always either, uh, they're belief-oriented primarily, or sometimes they're behavior-oriented. It stems from belief, I understand. This is a belief-oriented sermon, okay? It's like, man, we need to read this, get the cold water dumped on us, okay? Hear the, hear the clanging of the pots as we're getting prepared for ministry or as we're going out in our everyday life, many of you, okay? And experiencing the mission of God for every believer. We've gotta remember we don't just wrestle against flesh and blood, but that Jesus Christ is the one that we run to because he is powerful over, Lord over, Revelation uh, tells us all of, uh, he is He is. Lord over all that is, all right? And I wanna call us to remember that. I wanna call us to believe uh, in that today, okay? We come from a place, I think, in our culture that has praised God, uh, advanced scientifically and medically. And listen, I, I know I have not said this till now for a reason. I know some of you are like, man, are, is he against science? Is he against medicine? Absolutely not. Do I believe every single problem that we face has a spiritual component to it in terms of a demonic influence? Absolutely not. I love science, okay? I love medicine. I take an inhaler every day of my life. I love it. It's great. Here's what we've done. Over the last couple of hundred years, as we have increased in our knowledge of the physical body, we have allowed that to let, our culture has let, let something let go in terms of the fact that there is an evil that lurks. And what we've got to do as believers is just say like, man, we praise God for the uh, advancement. It is his common grace to us. And yet we can continue to elevate the fact that we live in a world that is filled with spiritual problems that need a spiritual answer and remedy and a people that are willing to stand in the gap. The commentators y'all and Mark are emphatic. I want you to think about this with me, okay? Mark is a shorter gospel, right? It's a, it's a shorter book. I mean, everything. I mean, like every other word in Mark is immediately. Okay, it's just like, man, let's, let's go. Okay, let's move, let's move. How come this story is three times longer than the account of it in Matthew then? Mark has something in his mind that he's trying to get across to us. And it is cold water in the face, a banging on the pan. It is wake up and don't try to go do ministry in a secular way. Realize that we have got to see not every problem has a pill. We gotta trust the power of Jesus Christ. I got three kind of quick little ways that we can do that and I'll be done. Okay, the first one is this. Hey, we trust the power of Jesus by remembering our own story. If we wanna, if we wanna, if we wanna go deep in faith today, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about our own story and our own gospel uh, story, our own conversion, what Jesus has done for us uh, and, and bringing us from death to life. Okay, and I know maybe everybody's not there. The majority here might be there. Listen, if you remember your story, okay, it reminds you of the power Power. Your story, listen, may or may not be as dramatic as this story here. I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your background was, okay? It may be, it may not be, I don't know. But whether it was as dramatic as this one or not, it was absolutely no less miraculous. All right, Jesus Christ has come not to make people better, but to make them new. 
Jesus Christ has come to take people who are not just living in the tombs, but are dead in their trespasses and sins and quicken them to life once again. Y'all, we were living in the tombs before Jesus Christ met us in a sense. We were wrapped up, whether it was a demonic oppression or sin or pride or rebellion or whatever it is. Y'all, we were wrapped up. We were in sin. We were dead in our sin. We were separated from God. We were without hope in the world. And Jesus Christ came. What is the gospel? He lived a life that we didn't live and died a death that we deserve so that in his resurrection, we too could walk in the newness of life. And that's what Jesus Christ has come to do for us. You know, the, the beauty of, the, of remembering is we look back and we go, wait a minute. It's not just uh, the demoniac that came out of living in the tombs. You and I come out from living in the tombs when we are saved. And we only get to come out of living in the tombs for one reason. You know why we get to live outside of the tomb? Because Jesus Christ came back to life inside a tomb. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross, was laid in a tomb, and the same power that awoke in him, man, has come into our life. And now we get to live outside of the tombs as well. Don't we understand? I mean, why seek you to living among the dead? Because that is true of Christ. Man, something has changed in us. And when we remember that, it's very powerful uh, for us. We were needing to be freed from sin, broken as demons, death. You know, if you're not a believer here today, and, and I would imagine here or online, that is probably true of some people, okay? Uh, being in school, thinking about ministry, all that kind of stuff. Um, man, you know, working for a seminary or whatever, that's, that's not all that it is. Somebody might be in that situation here today. And if you are there, I just wanna ask you, man, are you living in the tombs? Are you wrapped up in sin? Is there no fortification in your life against the demonic realm, whether that's supernatural or naturally demonic? All right, come to the light of Jesus Christ uh, today. Don't you want to see the chains broken? Don't you want to see the torment of hiding cease? Don't we want to see self-inflicted wounds be bound and healed? There is a day coming when the powerful nature of Jesus Christ is going to come where the demons are not just cast into the Sea of Galilee, but they are cast, Revelation 20, into the lake of fire for all time. Don't we want to live in a world that is free of demonic oppression, the new heavens and the new earth? And I can't wait, I can almost hear the trumpet. I hope that if you're not a believer, you would come to Christ today. Man, you would come and you would talk to those that are around you that can lead you to him. Trust the power that he has. And believer, remember your own story, okay? And I can't get deep into this. Remember that you are not who you once were. It'll help you trust the power of Jesus. Secondly, trust the power of Jesus by sending those that are released by demons. Now, here, here's what I wanna say, all right? Many of us in churches that are discipleship oriented, as, as, as my church is, man, we do groups, uh, man, our elders, man, we get into it with people, uh, and I know that's the type of church you guys wanna be in. I think churches like ours even can be scared to release somebody that's got a crazy past. We can be scared to release somebody that's got egregious sin, demonic possession or oppression or influence, maybe addiction in their past, brokenness sexually in their past, whatever it is. We can be scared because we feel like they're gonna fall back into sin. We feel like they're gonna do this. We feel like they're gonna do that. We're not quite sure. We wanna watch them balance this with what I'm saying. Yes, we've got to disciple people. Obviously, we've gotta be willing uh, you know, to, to hold some back and to continue to, uh, if, if we see somebody that's walking into something that's too much for them or whatever, all I wanna say in this is this, okay? The very foundation, one of the building blocks of our discipleship with a new believer is to send them out to tell others what Jesus has done for them. That's not a part we can hold them back from. <laughs> We've gotta be willing to release those uh, that have been released by, by Jesus from a demonic realm. You know what's interesting to me uh, about this passage? Man, I've read this. I had one of my assistants read this. I had one of our, our, uh, our, our, uh, our residents read this. Okay, we've been reading the book of Mark, reading the book of Mark. And this, to my knowledge, okay, I think this is right. If you go through the entire book of Mark, you know, this is the only time where Jesus actually tells somebody to go tell of the mercies of God because of what he has done for them after, after healing them. What happens in all the other ones? Either he says nothing to them or he tells them not to say anything. It's kind of that secret sort of narrative. But one place in the book of Mark, you have Jesus tell a guy, hey, go out and tell about the mercy of God in your life. Now you get into the commentaries, y'all, they wrap themselves into a knot trying to explain that. All right, what they say is, well, this guy was a Gentile, obviously, and therefore his ministry wasn't. Well, go back to, you know, go to Mark chapter seven. He heals another guy in the exact same region. He tells him not to go tell anybody. I mean, there's, there, listen, maybe, maybe there's something to that. I'm not sure. Here's what I do know after reading it a bunch of times, okay? There's only one guy that Jesus tells, go and share about the mercy of God. And you know what? There's only one guy that after being healed said to Jesus, I wanna go with you. <laughs> Isn't that funny? 
One time somebody says, man, I want to go with you. Where are you going? That's where I'm going. And it just happens to be that's the same guy that Jesus said, man, go back home and tell of the mercy of God in your life. What's the application point? There is nothing more contagious than a new believer who is on fire because they remember that they are not who they once were because of the power of Jesus. And I think that we need to remember that as we do ministry. Hey, thirdly and finally, in terms of just, uh, just trying to you know, apply that idea of trusting the power of Jesus Christ, and this is the crux of it, y'all. Let's trust the power of Jesus by praying for healing, okay? Let's, let's trust in the power of Jesus by coming to him and praying for healing from the demonic realm, okay? Now, you say, well, how can we be influenced by the demonic realm? Uh, man, I, I don't know about you, I, I've always been taught, I believe this, my soul's off the market, okay? I got saved when I was six years old in a Winn-Dixie parking lot after a church league softball game of my dad's. It don't get no more Southern Baptist than that, okay? That's a fact. I got saved on <laughs> Nightbox Road, Middleburg, Florida, six years old. Soul came off the market, got it. But can I still be influenced? Man, do, is, there, is there still things that we need to pray against? There are physical uh, ailments that can come that are not of physical causes. You know, they manifest physically, but actually there's a spiritual thing uh, that is going on. What I want to call us to is to realize what Richard Baxter said, that in the same way that someone has a remedy for being physically tired, which is to rest, there is a remedy for someone who is demonically influenced, and that is the word and prayer. But are we praying that way? I mentioned this earlier, that we can be a people who end up praying to God in a secular way. That's weird, isn't it? And you can end up praying, but you're praying in a secular way. What do I mean? I mean that we're praying to God, that's obviously spiritual. But what we end up doing is we're praying to God and the things that we're voicing to him have all of these hidden assumptions that everything that we're praying to him about have a physical root, have a physical cause. I wanna call you guys to be awakened, to realize, man, we don't command demons. We don't push demons around any more than we command someone to be healed. If they're a paralytic, we do not command that they stand up and walk. We bend the ear of the one who has all the power. Are we doing that in our prayer life? Man, when we're praying for people, are we praying against the demonic realm to the one who has the power? Man, the fear of demons is a praying church. The fear of demons is a praying church that prays in this way. And I'll end like this. You know, I think about, you know, we have a power as believers. Y'all, but that power is a delegated power, okay? It's, our, it's not our power. You see the guys on TV and they're commanding demons around and all that kind of stuff. I would never advise that. Acts chapter 11, okay. I would, I mean, you, you know, I would, that, we bend the ear of the one who can, are we? You know, I think about it like this. My kids, I got four kids, and, um, and it's funny, the older ones, you know, I might say to one of them, like, hey, go upstairs and get your sister, okay? And I tell her to come down here, I wanna see her. And, you know, a minute later, he'll come down, and, and he'll say, hey, man, she won't come, sorry. And, and I'm, like, I'm like, okay, wait, did you tell her that I told you to tell her to come down? No. <laughs> well, of course she's not gonna come. If you tell her not to, you know, if you tell her to come, she's not listening, she, you don't have that authority in her life. Go back up there and tell her that dad said to come down, okay? Maybe she still don't come sometimes. No, I'm just kidding, she comes, okay? The idea is a delegated authority. The idea is him going and saying, hey, I'm not saying this to you. Man, dad is saying this to you. You know, and I don't want to, any, every analogy breaks down. You could push any analogy too far. My point is, hey, are we on our knees are we praying for the nations that we just prayed for beautifully today? Are we praying for people in our churches? Are we praying in our own life, our family, people that we wanna see come to Christ? Are we praying not only about the physical things in their life, are we praying specifically for Jesus to exert power over the demons? Let's pray. Father, as we come uh, to you today, Lord, I just pray that we will have from Mark 5 a deepened faith. Lord, I pray that we will believe in deep ways in your power. Uh, God, we know that you have power over the demonic realm, and we pray, um, Lord, that you will exert it, you will put hedges. God, I pray that you will do the miraculous in our midst. We're asking you, in Christ's name we pray, amen.